So I've noticed a lot of messages, or memes they're called on Facebook, that have been labelled as incorrect and assessed by a so-called independent fact-checker. Um, and that really provoked this morning, this afternoon actually, in me a sort of internal debate as to what that means precisely. You know, what is an independent fact-checker? Um, is someone possible to be independent? Um, and what would that actually look like? Um, well, this is a really interesting question, not just for the subject of the alleged coronavirus pandemic, but also for other subjects too. You know, actually looking at somebody's um, role in how they relate to other people within society, what their allegiances are, what each of our biases are, um, it's a really important thing to consider actually within life uh, in how we assess the validity of different topics of what constitutes as evidence and how valid we can assess it is. We have to assess who is saying something and obviously what they're saying. We have to look at the merits of what they're saying, the content of the actual evidence itself. But also it's important to discern who's saying it and why they might be saying it too. Um, because we all can have different motives in life um, that can be born about for a variety of different reasons. Um, it could be because of our inherent biases that we all have. And if we don't self-evaluate those and be conscious of those, you know, making assumptions that we don't have biases, then it's too often easy for us to unconsciously overlook those. Let me give you an example. You know, I've grown up in a particular family and they've taught me particular ideas. And at a young age, I'm only aware of those ideas that I've come into contact with, that which I've been exposed to, until I'm a lot older and I've met more people and I've then come into contact with ever more ideas. I'm able to then assess the validity of different ideas but when I'm more limited in the type of ideas, I can only really relate to what I've experienced. And so that's true for all of us. Um, and we have to look at, you know, the type of ideas that we have come into contact with and also assess how we've come into contact with those are and trying to relate that to a wider context. You know, let me give you a specific example, I guess. Um, so, theologically, um, if I have grown up in a particular religion and I'm only aware of that religion's ideological beliefs, then I'm not in a position where I'm able to objectively discern and discuss the merits of one type of religious belief as opposed to another, because I wouldn't be aware of what those other religious beliefs were. There's also a problem that if I'm looking at something and I'm surrounded by other people that all overwhelmingly believe in something and that they're going to therefore encourage me to believe in that, um, that there may all be a psychological and indeed an emotional motive for me to want to believe that. Um, if I'm living under the house of my parents, for example, and mum and dad both believe the same thing and they encourage me to do so, there's a good motive for me then to want to be in their good books, to impress them. If I want to stay in their house and not argue with them, um, you know, then there's a motive there, isn't there? You know, if I live independent of mum and dad, however, um, then I'm much more likely to be independent of their views. Um, that stands for, to reason, doesn't it? There's quite a simple argument and it's quite obvious then. You know, if I'm... Um, give you another example if I'm receiving money from someone there's a financial motive that I am going to want to consider the views of the people that are paying my salary I've got to consider you know when I'm making a qualified statement you know who is paying my money if I consider the financial rewards that I'm receiving an important thing and it indeed can be important in some contexts, of course, which is essentially why Socrates believed that education itself shouldn't be something that is financially rewarded. Well, one could argue that perhaps he was in a privileged position to take that view himself, that he had a degree of financial independence, although one might 
equally and validly argue as well that he made good use of his position and that independence that he had and that he didn't go out and have the need to be paid financially or rewarded for his views, um, that he was able to take advantage of that position, that he could give a view to other people whereby he could express an opinion without any consideration of what the financial um, consequences would be to him. But of course, one might argue there might have been other consequences too, you know, even if he was wealthy, criticising other people that were potentially influential, powerful, authority figures could have other consequences in terms of his life, in terms of his physical and mental well-being and his relationship with others and his social standing also. So it's not just, of course, your financial position, your physical, your mental, your psychological and emotional position as well. Um, so there's a whole realm of different things, you know, that to consider within that. An actual fact, what is an independent fact checker is a much more complex and interesting debate that everyone should should be engaging within, um, not just for this particular subject of coronavirus specifically, but in terms of other subjects also. You know, what is an expert in a particular field? Um, what makes them independent? Uh, what are they independent of? You know, um, and that's a particularly interesting thing to concern yourself with when it's especially concerning and really important issues that can have real term consequences to how we relate to other people in the type of choices that we make within our lives. Um, you know, for example, if you're critically ill and you're assessing what kind of treatment you might choose, you know, and you have to assess um, various doctors' positions when weighing up the possible risks, side effects, and also the possible benefits of different treatments. You have to assess what those different doctors' verdicts are in their medical assessments. You know, and you might want to assess, you know, how independent the doctors are uh, when making those assessments, do they have any other motivations that could be a conflict of interests, for example? You know, or is the doctor purely motivated um, to want the best treatment um, for his patient, hopefully? Um, or, you know, could there be other things as well? It might not just be financial rewards. It could be that the doctor um, has been professing um, a particular view in treatment for a long period of time. Um, it could be that he's schooled within a particular type of medicine, um, that he would generally favour that type of medicine um, as opposed to other types of beliefs. Oh, he would need to weigh up and consider what the validity of those different schools of medicine are in general, um, to consider what different doctors' views are. And that's particularly difficult when you are not an expert within that field, isn't it? I know I've found within the coronavirus debate, it's been really difficult for me to assess the validity and the authenticity of the different tests to determine whether someone has a coronavirus or not. Especially because it seems, during my studies, I found a lot of different doctors, a lot of virologists and epidemiologists, I think it might be, I may be mispronouncing that, but it seems that there's a variety of different doctors on different sides of the debate um, that are equally arguing um, for the validity that is reasonably authentic. Um, some doctors seem to be suggesting that. But there are other doctors that are suggesting opposite views that the actual tests, or at least some of them, are not reliable and are not authentic. And so the type of arguments are using very complex language um, that's very esoteric. It involves studying and knowing what a variety of lots of different medical terms mean. Um, and so it's quite difficult for a layperson on the outside. But that's true for any subject, of course. You know, someone that's not versed and studied in theological terms, you know, doesn't understand the complexity, perhaps, of a variety um, of different theological terms, um, you know, hasn't taken the sufficient time and energy to study those different concepts. Um, you know, it's a study even when you have taken those terms to weigh up and try and 
uh, discern what their merits are and what the pros and cons are to different subjects. And so all I can say is, um, you know, it's a long, lengthy process and rushed trials make bad verdicts. And I mean by that, that there's a reason why good trials tend to be quite long. I know they can sometimes be too long. Um, Sometimes there is a tendency to be quite lengthy, to repeat arguments too much, to go off on wild tangents or to introduce irrelevant topics um, that sort of distract people from the real essence of what the arguments are about within the um, specific trial. Um, But oftentimes a trial itself has got a lot of complex arguments, both for and against, and involves the various jury members taking the time to sufficiently study things because it's important, you know, someone's life hangs in the balance. You don't want to come to the wrong verdict and find that you've sentenced an innocent man to prison. On the other hand, you don't want to free someone who's potentially dangerous um, to harm other people in society, you know, with serious offences. So in, in a serious case, it demands that we pay serious attention and take sufficient time to do justice to the complexity of a subject, you know, in any subject that is serious enough, that warrants us all to dedicate a certain amount of time to actually studying it. Now, of course, in a good trial, it means that we need to take sufficient breaks. All, you know, jury members need to take a break now and again because subjects can be overwhelming mentally, emotionally, of course. You know, it takes its time and turmoil. But it's necessary to engage within that debate too as well. Um, and to discuss with each other. You know, it's learning to also engage and to discuss with other jury members the whole wealth of the different issues um, and sort of to embrace discussing those issues and the complexity of them in a respectful manner. Um, And that enables us, sorry, it it means that we have to allow ourselves to hear other people that are going to argue things that we may be opposed to, to hear the validity and discern the validity of opposing arguments, because we may be swayed by those, or we may sway others by those, by our own beliefs. And we have to question, why do we have beliefs? And is the evidence we're using to justify those really credible? You know, and it can be a long, drawn out process. And it's important to necessarily engage within that in a healthy, respectful manner. Um, you know, I know that's quite difficult to do. Um, some issues are emotional. It's a question of trying to be balanced. We don't want to be driven purely by emotion, um, by anger or depressive and sad issues that pull at the heartstrings. But at the same time, we don't want to be devoid of any emotion. There is an emotional dimension to life, you know, and we have to be respectful and considerate of that as well. You know, we have to weigh up, you know, what is reasoned, um, reasoned in a, a reasoned emotional response to an issue, you know. For example, you know, it's reasoned that somebody who's gone through legitimate grief might experience some degree of depression for a, a, a period of time, you know, quite reasonable. Um, you have to dis- discover and discern what is legitimate emotionally, you know, that, that involves us doing um, an emotional analysis of ourselves, of others, of our life experiences, of course. And, you know, is it legitimate um, that I get emotional about a specific case within coronavirus, you know, of people um, suffering? Um, well, it, yes, it's legitimate to show people do have emotions to suffering, Um, But of course, it's also legitimate to consider other emotional responses to suffering in a wider context also. Um, So it's it's, um, really important to sort of try and consider objectively, but also to allow ourselves to have a restrained, reasonable emotional response as well. You know, we're not we're not um, objective beings. We're not objects. 
we have to somehow have a reasoned, balanced, emotional response to these issues. And that, that involves us discerning, you know, what is a reasonable emotional response. Your life experiences are a guide to you. You may have lost relatives in the past. You may have witnessed and experienced your own and other people's sufferings too. And so that's good guide there to sort of tell you what is a reasonable res response. You know, you may have been the victim or friends or family members ha may have been. You may have experienced grief, um, suffering of other viruses um, or other critically ill um, illnesses, you know, that naturally come with their own emotional effects as well. So you're in a position when you have experienced, witnessed um, such things that you know what the emotional dimension to that type of situation is. And so you have to bring your own life experiences physically, mentally, emotionally as well um, as evidence. You know, what else do you have but your own life experiences? It's quite hard to assess what those are sometimes. Um, sometimes we can edit, we want to pick and choose. It's quite hard to go back and evaluate emotional issues, whether we legitimately did respond to an issue. Did we strive enough that we could have done or do we somehow give in to that temptation of um, indulging in emotions sometimes and dwelling too much um, prolonging it for um, sympathy sometimes there's a tendency we all have for that or did we repress what our natural emotional instinct was to a situation you know it's feeling what is a legitimate response um, that's quite hard to do and it takes a certain amount of effort um, and assessment in looking and not just looking at our own responses but a variety of other people from different sources too um, so it's really important, I feel, you know, when we're engaging within, you know, viewing what is reasonable responses, both physically, mentally, uh, but also emotionally too. You know, we don't want to be emotionally manipulated by information, you know, but at the same time, we don't want to be robotic and objective only and be closed and cold and aloof to any kind of true and legitimate emotional need that um, something naturally provokes within us. You know, it's trying to discern that. If I see something where uh, someone is really upset about something and I feel there's an authentic uh, truth to what they're actually telling me, you know, and I can see and hear the details of their story seemed kind of um, believable, plausible, and their emotional response does too. Um, it seems genuine and authentic. You know, I might assess that it seems quite real evidence. If I've got somebody playing violins in the background, however, if I, if I find it's littered with cliches um, or, or that their emotions don't seem to match up with the words that they're saying or that it seems to um, have some sort of other agenda as well, I might rightly and reasonably question um, what their motives might be as well within that, you know, and whether it is actually um, credible or not. I might not know, and there are sometimes grey areas where it's quite acceptable to be agnostic about a situation. Somebody might cry on the stand and I might say... Are they really upset about that issue? Were they really affected by that? Or are they doing that um, to try and gain some sort of sympathy from the jury to sort of sway their um, assessment? Um, so, you know, sometimes I'm not sure and we can't always make exact absolute judgments. We're not all knowing and that's OK to sometimes say we're not always so sure. But sometimes, you know, you, know, you can be quite sure. Uh, we've all had examples in our life where we've sat with someone and we've heard um, we've heard a story, a tale of joy, it could be, or a tale of woe. Um, they've been able to sort of recall the events in minute detail very specifically. And we can question them on it and they're able to sort of ad lib and go into great detail accounting for how they experienced and what they did. And their emotions actually, um, they really relate to the actual words and the tone and the gestures that they're using as well and it and it seems like yeah but of course we also have to assess you know sometimes people are talking about something that they've experienced a long time ago 
and they may have repressed the emotions. Um, you know, they may well be used to sort of recalling details without being overly emotional, you know. So we have to assess, you know, we, we have to look at how credible are they, but how able are we to assess the credibility as well? It's a much more complex thing in some situations. Sometimes it's really obvious and overt that you're being played and someone is acting and you sort of wonder how they think um, the other people w will not realise that. Um, other times it's really, really obvious that someone is authentic and genuine, actually. And But the, over, there's often times when you're really not sure, when you really, it's like, uh, or when you maybe have doubts or suspicions, but you can't be too sure. Um, you know, somebody might have a particular learning difficulty. They may not express their emotions the same ways that others do. And so you'd have to know what's typical for that person in terms of evaluating that individual. Um, what's the context of that situation, of that person? Um, of what's normal for them? Um, you know, you might have to speak to other people, um, you know, and, and find out how reliable they are too. Um, I kind of look at it simply like you can know some of the people some of the time, but you can't know all the people all the time. You can know some validity of some evidence some of the time, but you can't know the validity of all the evidence all the time. That's a good rule of thumb for me, actually, that I generally go by. Um, you know, and, you know, you can know some things and you don't know some things, isn't it, really? And you sort of have to live with knowing some things um, and trying to convince other people the merits and the reasons why you feel you know those things and the evidence to justify that, but also to keep an open mind to the areas and to remain agnostic and still searching and studying where you don't know those things. And, you know, that takes some humility from all of us to admit it's often a large area of agnostic knowledge or lack of knowledge. It's often quite a large area where we don't know and it's not just a simple total not knowing. There's different degrees of not knowing, isn't there? It's like, I totally don't know one situation. I know a bit in some situations, but not that much. I know a reasonable amount in some places, but not enough to really know. I know some things, I don't know other things, somewhere in the middle. I know quite a lot, but still not sufficient. I know reasonable that to convict but I don't know absolutely everything. And then there's total knowledge on the other end of the spectrum. I know totally a situation and I don't know, I don't need to sort of investigate it anymore. So rather than totally knowing and totally not knowing, there's a whole variety of different stages within the spectrum, you know, of knowledge. Um, so we don't have to assess things as I totally know someone or something or some subject. There can be a whole range of different degrees of I I know nothing. I know a little bit. I know a fair amount. I know quite a lot. I know lots and lots. I know everything. And so there's a whole different sort of like stages within that. It's not sort of like here or there. This all is sort of like intermediate to intermediary stages in between those two sort of extremes of total totally knowing something totally not knowing anything it's generally often somewhere sort of within there isn't it and sometimes it it's sometimes according to what new information you get it sometimes sort of fluctuates as it goes that way and that way and you're never quite sure in a trial whether it's sort of going to go there or there sometimes and that's how trials sometimes go, at least, isn't it? It's sort of you fluctuate. One day you feel something about someone and situation. New evidence presents itself, you know, the next day. Or um, you get a breakthrough when you're studying something during the discussion between other jury members. And that can sort of sway you the other direction. And sort of like, sometimes it's like that, isn't it? And it can be a, a mental and emotional roller coaster sometimes. Um, or the, you know, hence the need to take some sort of break. Um, just because it can be emotionally overwhelming. And also because, of course, you need to get some perspective on something. Sometimes you can't see the tree for the woods. When you obsess and look at something, you have a tendency to sort of go on about things. Yeah. And as having that perspective and looking at other issues, um, you know, going off and um, doing a bit of exercise, having something to eat, having a break, 
discussing other issues, other things. Um, that gives you a chance to sort of um, reflect away from the heat of discussing things, that sort of debate with other jury members. And so, you know, it's good to have that perspective too as well. It gives you time alone to discuss things and to meditate to yourself and to evaluate your own performance and your own integrity of how you're relating to others. And also, um, sort of like, you need time where you're engaging in debates with others, uh, discussing things with others. You know, that's essential too, isn't it? Having that time alone and also that time discussing things with others too. And that's the nature of all kind of trials, isn't it, really? <laughs>